damnation. Health Organization has now confirmed what many epidemiologists have been saying for weeks. The coronavirus is a pandemic. Sioux Falls first, in person and online. So glad you're here. What a wonderful day to worship the Lord. And in fact, somebody uh, reminded me of the scripture today. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. And there's something about coming together with the people of God, uh, whether it's um, at a distance and you're watching or whether you're here in person. And we know God is gonna meet with you today. I did wear my shirt that was sent to me like three and a half months ago finally got to wear it free hugs i was going to wear it last week but i thought as we were doing child dedications that would be awful creepy to wear the shirt so i thought i can wait one more week um, but honestly how many know we we uh we sometimes need hugs right and there's been a lot of distancing and and if you're still needing the distance i won't bother you but if you need a hug i'm okay you can come and, and give me a hug and i'm so glad to, uh, to be able to do that. And as Brother Ron would say, it's COVID-free hug. So you can come get a COVID-free hug from me. And, uh, but I'm just, man, I'm so excited. God is doing some amazing things um, in this city, in this church. And uh, in fact, this past Friday night, right here in this building, we had a community worship night and prayer. And uh, it was absolutely awesome. It was like heaven to be able to come together with people from different churches across the city, Little C, that we came together to be the big C, to lift up the name of Jesus and to unify together, to lay down our labels, to lay down our differences, to lay down um, our competition, competitive nature, and uh, just to worship Jesus. And, uh, and Jesus showed up. And, um, you know, the, the scripture the Lord reminded me of as I was watching this happen was in Psalm 133 when, when the Lord says in his word that how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. And then you keep reading. You don't stop there because it's a good thing. But then you get down a few verses later. It says uh, it's in that place there's a commanded blessing. And I want to just commit to you as your pastor that we will be recipients of God's commanded blessing because we will walk in unity in this community. And I believe this, that we're much better together than we are apart. In fact, you know what? I think the scripture is very clear. Jesus said that um, this very thing would be tested. And we know we live in a time, a season of humanity where anger and rage and division seems like it's at an all time high. And yet Jesus said in the midst of that testing that they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. That we have an opportunity to be his kingdom on earth in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the things that are happening, the craziness in the, this world. And um, I wanna be part of what God is doing, amen? Don't you? So let me just encourage you as you turn in your Bibles to first... Corinthians 15 and then 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 I know it was mentioned on the video but I encourage you to take notes in a series like this that we're doing on the last days the end times uh, everything that you need to know is not going to happen on Sunday morning so I encourage you in your personal discipleship always to dig into God's word through the week 
but specifically in this series that you continue to read scripture and, and, and study the end times. Because here's what I'm learning. There's a lot of false information out there. There's a lot of things being said that God never said. And for us to know what God said, we have to get into his word so we can speak to what he didn't say in conversations. And so I encourage you to take notes. You can go to our YouVersion Bible app and you can go to live event. You can put notes there. You can get out an old fashioned pen and paper and take notes as well. But do that if you're watching us online. If you just share this feed, I know that uh, it's a simple way you can share the gospel with other people. You never know who's gonna watch. You never know who uh, might be hungry for truth that God may draw to that feed to hear the gospel. And so thank you for doing that. But would you just pray with me today? Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we thank you for the presence of God that has been so real here today. We thank you that you're God that draws near. God, I'm reminded of the garden when and Adam and Eve are walking through the garden in the, in the cool of the day that you were there with them. You were, you were communing, you were interacting with them. In the same way you desire through Jesus Christ to restore, Lord, that fellowship. And so Jesus, help us as we, as we draw near to you to sense your presence. I pray, God, that you would move all across this building, for those watching online, for those that may be watching later, that the Holy Spirit would not only teach us and give us truth, but Father, I pray that we would be transformed by truth, that we'd become different based on what we hear, that we'd allow your word to come to fruition in our hearts. God, I pray you'd move across this campus, kids ministry, I pray that you do your work in the lives and the hearts of every person. God, we love you and thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. 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 One more thing I want to mention to you that as you leave today, um, you can visit one of our missionaries, uh, Teresa Kashali Shulton, who has Teresa's House Orphanage in Congo. Um, she's out there and she's preparing to um, help her students go back to school, getting them shoes and clothes and, and uh, school supplies. We support her monthly, and because you do that, these kids are fed and, and blessed. But this is an opportunity for us uh, to make a donation. You can get a beignet, you can get a pie, and you can ask questions. I know she'll be out there and her team, and would be, would be thrilled to answer any questions that you have. And I wanna say thank you for not only being faithful in your tithe, but being faithful in your missions giving, because your missions giving is causing the gospel to go around the world, not only around Sioux Falls, thank God for the gospel going to Sioux Falls, but around the world. Amen? Amen. So the story is told of British explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton, who was on a South Pole expedition with a few men and left them on Elephant Island, promising that he would come back again and get them. Later, when he tried to go back, huge icebergs blocked the way. But suddenly, as if by a miracle, an avenue opened up in the ice, and Shackleton was able to get through. His men, who were ready and waiting, who were anticipating his returns, quickly scrambled aboard. No sooner had the ship cleared the island that behind them, the ice crashed back together, closing the gap that they had just come out of. Contemplating their narrow escape, the explorer said to his men, it was fortunate that you were all packed and ready to go. They replied, we never gave up hope. Whenever the sea was clear of ice, we rolled up our sleeping bags and reminded each other, the boss may come today. You see, there expectancy determined their preparation. And I wanna ask all of you a question today, those online, those in the house, those watching later. Are your bags packed and are you ready to go? As we, close, as we continue this series called Endgame where we are discovering biblical truths about the last days. And even as I mentioned to you that there's a lot of speculation there are a lot of things that are being talked about and discussed out there in the world that do not line up with God's word that actually incites fear in people's hearts. And so we have to have an understanding 
of these final hours, these last days, so that we can speak truth in the midst of the enemy's lies. And today we're going to be talking about the rapture of the church. Last week we ended with the words that Jesus said in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, that literally closes out the book. He says, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Jesus is speaking about the rapture of the church. And even though the word rapture is not found in the English translations of the Bible, there is a word where we get the word rapture. And it's called harpazo. And it means to catch up, to seize by force, to snatch away. And as we understand the rapture, we know this is exactly what Christ will do when he comes back and he receives his church. It will happen suddenly. It will be a snatching away, Christ coming for his bride. Now, last week we talked about Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, and we talked about how that that represented the time period of Christ up until the present day. And as you read those 13 verses, you'll understand that this is where we are living. This is, this is what's happening in the world right now. And then from 13 to 14, there's a gap. In verse 14, we see the abomination of desolation, which we'll be talking about. But literally, the middle of the tribulation is where we see verse 14. But between verse 13 and 14, there's this gap. There's this, this period of time that we, we, we don't read about necessarily in that passage, but it's speaking about the rapture of the church. So the very next thing to happen on God's eschatological calendar is the rapture. Last week we mentioned to you that I believe the only sign that is left to be fulfilled is that the gospel will be preached to every nation, every ethnos, every people group, and then the end will come. The end time events will begin to escalate and, and, and go forward from there, but the gospel is being preached. And because of technology and because of missionaries and missions organizations, the gospel is going forth in a rapid pace unlike any other time before. In fact, we mentioned that the seed company said that the Bible will be translated in every language on the planet by the year 2025. Man, I say, even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. And, and this rapture will set in motion a timeline of end time events that will lead to Christ's second coming, which we believe takes place after this seven year period of dark cataclysmic days called the tribulation, after which Christ will come back with his church. You see the rapture, he comes to receive his church, but at the second coming, he will come back with his church. And he will come up to set up his kingly and peaceful reign on earth for a thousand years, something that we know as the millennial reign of Christ. But today, I want to focus on, between verse 13 and 14, I want to focus on the rapture. Paul describes the rapture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52, when he says, listen, I tell you a mystery we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now it's interesting that he uses the word mystery. And up until that point, Nothing had been mentioned about the harpazo or about the snatching away, about the rapture up until this point. So he's revealing the mystery. He's revealing what has not been revealed in previous ages in this snatching away of the church, which he says will happen in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. In fact, the exact amount of time Light traveling at 186,000 miles per second 
to be reflected on the retina of the eyes. So in less than a nanosecond, the rapture will take place. Now I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because Paul gives us a little more information. He divulges a little bit more of, of what we can expect when we experience the rapture, the rapture of the church. So I want you to read with me, beginning at verse 13 of chapter 4. It says, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now look at verse 18. So countercultural to what is happening in the end times conversations today. Look at verse 18. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Wow. What a powerful thought. So Paul spends only about two to three weeks with these new believers at Thessalonica. He's teaching in the synagogue. He's instructing them in the word of God. And yet out of all the things that he could be discussing, every single aspect of doctrine, any kind of teaching in the word of God that he could share with these new believers, he chooses to share with them about the rapture of the church with these new believers. Now, I think that illuminates the truth to us that foundational to the understanding of eternity and the kingdom of God is the rapture of the church. In fact, scripture says that the Lord has placed eternity in all of us. That it just needs to be awakened. That it, that it needs to come to life in us that we realize that we are eternal beings. And because we are eternal beings, there's gonna be an exit to this life. There's gonna be an end to this life and a start to the next. And so he's wanting them to have a clear understanding of the rapture of the church. He's, he's saying it's very important that you understand this even as new believers. He doesn't want them to be ignorant. So what actually happens during this rapture? This snatching away of the church, and according to this passage. Well, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing that Paul goes into explaining some details that we can know. And the first thing we see at the rapture of the church is that the dead in Christ will rise first. So Paul speaks about those who have fallen asleep in Christ. It's the very language that Jesus uses when he receives word that Lazarus is sick. That his sisters called for him and he's on this journey. And while he's on his way there, realizing what has happened to Lazarus, he says in John chapter 11, verse 11, he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. So we know that when Jesus arrived, you know the story that, that Lazarus had died. He had been dead four days. He was, he was buried in the tomb and, and, and his family and his friends were grieving and mourning. And Jesus arrives there and has this conversation with the sisters. And then we see in, in a short period of time, he calls Lazarus from the grave and Lazarus resurrects. He's raised from the dead. He's no longer in, in a state of slumber. Now we read on in another passage in, in, uh, is when the deacon, Stephen, was being martyred for his faith, for his defense of the gospel. 
before these ruling authorities called the Sanhedrin. In which it says in Acts 7, verse 60, as he was literally being stoned to death, it says that he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I think one thing that we can learn as we read through Scripture and we understand what Paul is trying to say here is that the earthly perspective of death does not match the heavenly perspective of death. Especially when we consider those who have fallen asleep in Christ. I may have shared this with you before, but there is a vast difference between the funeral of a believer and the funeral of a non-believer. I mean, you sense it in the environment, you sense it in the atmosphere. I mean, when somebody knows Jesus, when you come to the funeral, it's church. I mean, there's a spirit of worship and excitement, not because this person has died. As we honor their life, we understand they've arrived. That everything they've built their life on, everything that they have, they've established in their heart when it comes to their faith in Christ, they are experiencing the reality of that in heaven. So let me just say this, don't you cry at my funeral. You just know that I'm hugging everybody I see when I pass the pearly gates. Right? Hug fast, I'm telling you. And there's a difference. And then, then you, 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 I've been to the funerals where, where people have passed away and didn't know Christ. And it was obvious they didn't know Christ. I mean, it, 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 was, it was tougher to swallow. It was much more difficult. Well, we, we see here that Jesus, the perspective that he has of, of death, especially for those who know Christ, is that it's not final. Even though these Thessalonian believers were wrestling with the idea of death and they died and they're gone and they're deeply mourning, he, he's letting them know, no, I, God sees death as sleep. In fact, it's interesting, but the word cemetery, clumiatarian, comes from the word that is used here and it means a place of sleep. It is similar to a Christian dormitory where Christians lie down and sleep, awaiting for the morning, awaiting for the resurrection of their body at the rapture of the church. In fact, I've shared this with you, how impactful my grandmother's life was on mine. And man, I, I, I feel like where, where I am today spiritually, where, where, where I am even in ministry is a lot based on my grandmother's investment and deposit in me. And even as a little boy, talking to my grandmother, asking her questions, hearing the same stories over and over and over again, I'll never forget um, those moments where we said, Grandma, you know what, I, I don't think I could handle your funeral, so let's just go up in the rapture together. We're gonna rapture together. We talked about that so many times. We're just gonna rapture together. Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna fly up together. We're gonna go to heaven together. And then when grandma became deathly sick and we knew that she was probably going home to be with the Lord, I remember telling her, Grandma, it's okay. It's okay. You, you, you get to go first. You get to go first. I'll catch up with you in the rapture. And, and, and the powerful idea of what happens when a believer in Jesus passes away that literally it's like them sleeping. In fact, Christ is the first fruits. He already beat death so that we can beat death. He already conquered death so that when we come to that moment in, in time, in that, that, that moment in time where the rapture takes place, that our resurrected body will stand as well. And we will go to be with the Lord forever. You see, knowing the future of believers who've died gives hope in the midst of pain and grief. Paul did not deny that the death of a believer causes pain and sorrow in the lives of their family. In fact, we see that with Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus, same story, he gets there and Lazarus is there and, and, and he literally steps into their emotion. You, you may think that God doesn't understand what you're walking through, the pain that you're feeling, the emotional strife that sometimes you have to battle through, but, but the Bible tells us that we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. 
that there's not one emotion, there's not one struggle, there's not one sorrow or pain in your life that he doesn't understand, that he's not experienced. And, and in this passage, we see that he steps right into the emotion of Mary and Martha and the family and friends that have gathered that, that, there that day. And, and Jesus even became emotional. And the Bible says that he even shed tears. That Jesus wept right there because of what was happening. Because Lazarus had passed away. But even as Paul said, I, you know, I understand, you, you're, you're going to experience that emotion. But he said, we don't grieve like those who don't have hope. You're gonna grieve, but it's a different kind of grief. It's a grief that is, that is healed and, and, and even met with this idea that this is not the end. This is not the end of our lives, that there's more waiting for us. In fact, when a believer dies, their soul goes to be with the Lord as they await that resurrection. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And with this understanding, there's never a time when the spirit of a person is unconscious. That even when they die, they're fully aware of everything around them, whether they are experiencing the joys of eternal life or the sorrow and torment of eternal death. We know that, again, a person that dies has fallen asleep according to scripture. Now let's continue in verse 16, which says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I want you to imagine with me, cemeteries around the world, busting open, the graves of believers throughout all of history, whether they're family or maybe characters we read about in Scripture, through, through all time, literally come out of the grave. Graves release their dead. What a moment that will be. In fact, I tell you, sometimes, maybe it's a weird obsession, but I, I like to walk through cemeteries. <laughs> Not at night. <laughs> but sometimes I'll just walk through cemeteries, and you know, a, a lot about a person's life is, is engraved on their stone. And, and, you, and you'll read about them and you'll just wonder, you kind of wonder what, what kind of life they lived. And sometimes you'll, man, they put like paragraphs of who they were and, 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 and you, can, you can identify that they were people of faith. They were people that loved Jesus. And, and man, I'm just, but as I walk through those cemeteries, here's what I think. I think what if the rapture happened right now? What an amazing moment it would be. I mean, you talk about you talk about a movie Hollywood has never written. <laughs> to see those cemeteries give up the dead will be a powerful moment. So where the bodies of believers will be changed instantly and stand up in attention at the eternal call of God. So Paul lets us know that the believers who died in Christ, that had a relationship with Jesus Christ, they were blood-bought and, and, and they were redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that they will rise first. And then he tells us what else will happen at the rapture. He said, the alive in Christ, those who remain, will join them in the air. Look at verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Hallelujah. So unlike his second coming, the rapture will show us Jesus not coming and touching down on earth, but he will come in the clouds. Again, in, at, at the rapture, he's coming to deliver his church, and in the second coming, he's coming back with his church. But we see that we will meet him in the clouds. So we get a glimpse of what will happen on earth at this very moment. The dead in Christ rise. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up with him. You can find this in Matthew chapter 24. In fact, Matthew ch chapter 24 gives us a tremendous documentary on what's going to happen during a lot of the last days, the final hours, even up until the rapture. 
And it says in verse 40 and 41, two men will be left in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. I mean, think about that. A large segment of society from around the world will suddenly disappear. And I will tell you that the news outlets won't know how to explain what just happened. This antichrist spirit that literally pushes away from truth will find other responses to let people know what happened. They'll say things like, man, must have been a UFO. Must have been alien abduction. Something happened that may try to fit our mind. And it's interesting that already in news media, they're already talking about UFOs and aliens. Kind of preparing the way for their conversation after the rapture happens. But I will tell you that those who were raised in Christ, those who know the word of God because they were taught the word of God, who may have turned their back on him, who may, their heart grew, grew cold towards him, will, will suddenly know exactly what happened. They will be fully aware that they have been left behind. And actually, those are the ones that can become the preachers during that time because they know exactly what has happened. You see, after the rapture, will be chaotic. Imagine with me several million people gone in the blink of an eye. Cars will crash because drivers will disappear. Planes will crash because pilots will disappear. That's your plane. That's your plane. Military leaders, business leaders, medical professionals will disappear in the middle of important projects or procedures, and it will create immense disruption to the world. The impact on the world after the rapture takes place will be catastrophic. In fact, I don't know about you, but maybe you saw the old movies, Image of the Beast, Distant Thunder. <laughs> exactly. I mean... I remember as a little boy, uh, Cleveland Assembly of God Church showed those movies and had revival nights and we brought our friends. And in fact, in our little town of 300 people, almost everybody showed up. And uh, I, remember, I remember watching this and thinking, man, I don't wanna miss the rapture. I'm gonna go first load. I don't wanna miss my plane. I wanna have my ticket in hand, punched. I don't care if I'm first class, they can, they can put me back near the toilet. It doesn't matter. I just want to be on the plane. Are you with me? And honestly, the Lord used that time to, uh, to awaken me to spiritual things, and I gave my life to Christ, even as a little boy there. Because the Bible says, 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It's going to happen without announcement without even any warning, it's gonna happen. In fact, that's even said in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, that he will come like a thief in the night. I want you to picture this with me. Have you ever seen a thief come to your door, maybe late morning, knock on the door, ring the doorbell, you open it, and they say, hey, we just want you to know that at two o'clock today, we are going to rob your house and you need to leave out your jewelry, leave out your, leave out your, your gun cabinet, open it up. Um, we're gonna take every valuable you have. Please leave the keys to your car because we're taking your vehicles. We are just letting you know today at two o'clock, we are gonna rob your house. That's crazy to think about. We know that's not the way it happens. We know a thief comes in the midnight hours. They lurk at night. They show up and come in stealth. They don't want anybody to know they're there. They come in and, and, and they take things and, and, and usually they're, they're wearing something to disguise who they are and they try to get as much as they can and, and, and come at night and, and, and then they leave. Well, well, scripture indicates to us that this is how the, the rapture of the church will happen. That it will come without announcement, without warning. When least expected, Jesus Christ will return to rapture his saints and take them to heaven. 
So what that means to you and I today, the applicable uh, point that we must uh, make sure that we are fulfilling is that we are ready at all times. So some of you that are in the room or maybe watching online that have said, you know, one day I'll give my life to Jesus. One day I'll get my heart right with God. One day I'll quit running from God. One day I'll, I'll get all my, my, my books in order and my life in order and I'll submit to him. Listen, you, you may miss out on the rapture because Jesus again tells us that he will come like a thief in the night and you're gonna think that it's, he's gonna come at a time that is least expected to you and to the world. So don't, don't gamble with your eternity. Don't gamble for just a few pleasures to miss out on what God has prepared for you. Because listen, whoever you are, whoever's listening today, God's, God's prepared a seat for you. You're not gonna get to the tick counter and say, oh, plane's full, you can't get on. There's a seat for you. He purchased your seat. But you have to be ready to go. He's coming back for a church that's ready. He's coming back for a church that's prepared for her wedding. The bride that's prepared for her wedding. In fact, I love what G. Campbell Morgan, the great expositor of Bible prophecy said. He said, I never lay my head on the pillow without thinking that perhaps before I wake up, the final morning may have dawned. I never begin my work without thinking that he may interrupt it to begin his own. And every night before we go to sleep, we ought to say, he may come tonight. Every day when we get out our tools and go to work, this may be the last day's work I'll do. And I was thinking about this, you know, in the early part of last century, coming out of Azusa Street, in that era of time, you could show up to any church, probably any Bible preaching church in America, and you would hear about the return of the Lord. You would hear things like, get ready, he's coming soon. There were even these old school signs out on the buildings of these churches that, that, that usually were blanking. Jesus is coming soon, are you ready? And I don't know what's happened since then, whether it's the skeptics have got to us or we've just lost our urgency, we've lost our passion, we've fallen asleep, maybe it's because of the delay in which I wanna remind you that a day is as a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is a day. God's not interested in our time schedule. That he says, you know what, remove that, just be ready. Don't look at the clock and say, oh, it's about this time, I need to get ready. No, he said, just be ready. Be ready in the morning, be ready at noon, be ready at night. Be ready to welcome his return. Be, look to the, be looking to the eastern skies knowing that at any moment it could happen. And my heart is ready, I'm anticipating his return. So how do we as the church, how do we as the people of God, how do we view the rapture? One thing I think we need to restore the conversation. In the midst of all the crazy, speculative things that are being said, things that are being posted, videos that are being sent, here's what's happening. Then we say, you know what? We're not meant to fear. And this thing about rapture and end times is causing a fear and panic and anxiety on this earth like never before. People are out of their minds. People are going crazy. But this passage tells me something different. This is when you think about the return of the Lord, he can come any moment, he can come at any time, any day, he can come before the day's over, before the week's over. Here's what he said, encourage one another with these words. He's saying instill courage in people. Here's what that's telling me, that when people are getting into crazy conversations at work, when they're getting crazy conversations in your family, then you open up the Bible and say, hey, we're gonna get away from speculation. We're gonna get rid of this, get, get away from this doom and gloom and fear and worry and, and, and hide in the bunker and make sure you take food and, 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 and worry. And we are gonna go to what scripture says. 
And he says, encourage one another. This is meant to encourage us. In fact, think about this. The first century believers lived under Roman dictatorship, oppression, abuse, and still served Jesus. And when they would encounter one another in the marketplace, on the streets, as they met together to worship God, they wouldn't say, hello, how you doing today? When they left that conversation, they wouldn't say, hey, have a great day, see you later, see you tomorrow. That's not the words they used. But the word they used, the one word they said when they were, whether they were coming or going, was this word, Maranatha. Look it up, Maranatha. When they greeted one another, they said Maranatha. When they left, they said Maranatha. The word Maranatha means the Lord is coming. And before we even get together again, he may come back. And here's what that did. That was an encouraging word. When they were facing persecution, when they were having a bad day, when they were looking and seeing all the crazy things that were happening in the world, just like are happening right now in the day that we live, and it's so easy to become discouraged, it's so easy to become weary and worn out with all the things that are happening right now and the speculation that's driving conversations and media and all those things. We can go, oh my Lord, God, what, what's gonna happen? Here's, here's what we say, Maranatha. Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Encourage one another with these words. Even, even when you're facing oppression, even when you're facing persecution, even when you're having a bad day, even when somebody uh, puts you down, makes fun of your work for serving Jesus, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. It gives perspective. And it should encourage, encourage our hearts. In fact, that's kind of how Paul viewed the return of the Lord. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 4, 8. He says, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. So when he comes back, he's bringing a prize. And he said, not only for me, the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So what does scripture tell us? That we should look at the return of the Lord with anticipation and excitement, not fear and dread. And I would just say this, if it's fear and dread, then you need to let perfect love in to cast out all fear. Then maybe you need to draw near to him and say, you know, maybe I'm not where I need to be. I'm gonna let the, the fear breaker come into my heart and live inside of me. Because the spirit of God inside of us is what cries out, even so come Lord Jesus. The spirit of God inside of us. So with that being said, I, I'll never forget as I close out. I'll never forget coming home as a little boy after my parents had given their hearts to the Lord. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, so she was always home. Coming home and coming into the house, not seeing mom, not seeing dad, yelling out in a little bit of a panicked voice, hey, anybody home? My brother wasn't there. Him going, oh no. So what do you do when you think you've missed your plane? You call Christians, or you find Christians. Well, my, my Sunday school teacher, back when I was just a little boy, she used to teach me the basics of faith at this little Assembly of God church that no longer exists. Her house and the church were three, three, well, three houses down. So I'd go down there and, and I, I wanted to see her. Because I knew if Sister Couture was still on earth, the rapture didn't happen. I'd find her. If I didn't find her, I'd hit the panic button. So then I'd go back to my house and I thought, you know what? It was back when phones weren't in your pocket. They were attached to the wall. And I get out the church directory and I thought, I'm gonna find out if the rapture happened. I'd start calling Christians. And if I got a busy signal or if the phone just kept ringing and ringing and ringing, they didn't have caller ID. I would call until I got a Christian on the phone. And as soon as I got a Christian, I'd hang up and relax. 
because I knew the rapture didn't happen. Aren't you glad that your, your faith in Jesus Christ isn't that, isn't that soft? Isn't that, it doesn't move that easy? As you grow up in the Lord, you realize if my heart is pointed towards heaven and I love Jesus Christ with all my heart and I'm not, God's not expecting perfection from me, but he is expecting progression from me. That if I'm looking towards heaven, that I realize when that trumpet sounds and the angel gives that shout, that the Lord will call me and I will go up as well. Amen. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place today? Because that's the question I wanna ask you, the same one we asked you last week. Are you prepared for the return of Jesus? Are you ready that our expectancy determines our preparation? Do you only prepare when you're living in expectancy? People that don't prepare aren't living in expectancy of his return. But if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Quentin, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. You may have leaned on religious works. You may have leaned on church attendance. You may have leaned on your, your dad, your mom, your grandpa, your grandma. But I wanna let you know that you'll, you're not gonna get to heaven on somebody's coattail. You're not gonna get to heaven on your own religious works. You'll only get there on his work, his work on the cross. And if there's a unsettling in your heart about your eternal destination and you're just not sure, then maybe these conversations that are happening and what's happening in the world, even the things you saw in the video are causing fear and anxiety in your heart, defeat in your heart. The Lord is wanting to come and change that, transform that in you. He's wanting to put in you this anticipation this expectancy that our groom is coming back to receive us as a bride. That he's getting ready to come back and receive his church. Those that he's purchased their salvation. Those that he's bought with his blood. Those who are anticipating the return of the Lord. He's coming. He's coming to receive us. And if you're not confident in that today, this is your opportunity. Whether you're watching online or sitting in these seats, I need a relationship with Jesus. Pastor Quentin, I'm not sure where I'm at with God. But I believe he died. I believe he resurrected. I believe he's coming back. And I want to make sure that he's the Lord of my life. If that's about nice clothes, if that's you, just wave at me. Anybody here today that would say that's me? Anybody? Anybody in this house, on the floor, in the balcony? Anybody? Thank you, Father. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? I see that hand. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Would you stand with me then? And whether you raised your hand or you know you needed to, we're going to pray a prayer to give you words to express what's happening in your heart. And I'm going to pray that prayer, and I want you to repeat after me, and I'm going to ask the whole church just to repeat after me. If you're watching online and Wherever you're at, you need to pray this prayer. Repeat after me as well. Would you do that? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to this earth to die in my place, to save me, to rescue me from my mess. I'm a sinner, and I realize I need a Savior. I know you died and resurrected for me so I receive the gift of forgiveness of sin and eternal life and I commit today that I want to live the rest of my life for you you are my Lord and I confess today I'm your son I'm your daughter I'm in your family in Jesus mighty name Everybody said amen. Come on, give the Lord praise for those that responded to him. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Let me just say, if you prayed that prayer today, online, if you would just put in the comments, I prayed that prayer, one of our pastors will reach out to you. 
If you feel more comfortable uh, sending an email to info at SiouxFallsFirst.com, we'll respond to you. If you're in this house today, when the prayer team comes, would you come, even if you have to bring somebody with you and say, would you go pray with me? We wanna make sure you have what you need as you begin this journey. It's not a one and done. It's a relationship that will grow and become greater and stronger. And we wanna make sure you have a Bible. We want you to make sure you know you have a family. And we wanna help you. You can also go back to our Next Steps area and let them know as well. But I'd like to ask our prayer team as we close out, our prayer team to come. And we are praying for an urgency to be awakened in the church. And, and I, I want you to just to continue to pray with me in that. But maybe today you're here and you have a need in your life Maybe it's a physical need, a sickness. Maybe it is a financial need. Maybe it's a relational need. Maybe it's a marriage. I don't know what it is, but here's what we know. We serve a God that doesn't know the word impossible. There's nothing he can't do. And we love the opportunity to pray with you, to stand with you, to encourage you in the Lord. As we sing this song, Christ be magnified, we wanna allow you to come. We wanna encourage you to come and receive prayer today. God bless you, church. Let's worship.